Okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, session, one more session on mobility. My name is Mohamed Mezgani. I am the Deputy Secretary General of UITP. UITP is the French acronym of uh, the International Association of Public Transport. So it's an association, it's a multimodal uh, association representing all modes, rail and uh, buses and uh, waterborne and taxis and uh, all shared public transport modes. Uh, UITP gathers uh, uh, transport operators, those operating transport in cities like TMB here in Barcelona or FGC, the transport regulating authorities and uh, the industry suppliers, manufacturers, manufacturing trains and buses and ticketing systems and, and, and so on. So we have about 1,400 members in 96 uh, countries and 16 offices world worldwide. The session today is about implementing flexible and multimodal transport services. Of course, if you are here, it means that you are convinced that mobility is a key element in uh, smart uh, cities. And then efficient and sustainable mobility will make access, of course, to services, to jobs, to people and to goods easier. And this is the, the aim, I would say, of, of, a, of a, a sustainable and efficient mobility. So to make it easy and comfortable, safe, for, and affordable for people to move, uh, it's essential to offer multimodal door-to-door -door mobility uh, solutions. This is the aim of the sessions, is to discuss the need of flexible mobility solutions and see how to make them uh, real in, 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 in the cities. So I would like before maybe starting reminding that, and, and maybe you, you may not agree, but I think mobility now is experiencing a transition, uh, a transition at, at different uh, levels. First, there is the energy transition uh, with the growing electromobility, growing electromobility not just for rail, but for road transport, mainly in uh, buses and cars, etc. There is a technology transition with the uh, digitalization of transport services and increasing connectivity of, of transport services, and the business transition with the uh, emergence of new players, new business models, and also new governance systems. So, of course, these trends are making mobility more complex to organize, but is offering plenty of opportunities for cities and for citizens. So we'll learn more about those opportunities from our speakers today. We have four speakers. Actually, we don't have a panel, we have a man manel. It's the way they call it now in the US, I heard. So, four speakers uh, representing different types of uh, stakeholders involved at uh, different levels or different aspects of, of mobility. We have a deputy mayor representing the policy side. We have an advisor with more scientific and technical background. We have an operator who will focus on the entrepreneurship approach of public transport. And we have a service supplier representing the business and industry side. So, as you can see, it's a variety of, of, uh, of uh, profiles and it will bring, I'm sure, diversity and uh, richness in the, uh, in the debate. So, before we start with the first speaker, I would like to uh, tell you a word about this Ask and Vote app. I don't know if you are familiar with it, but for this year, uh, there is a specific app which will uh, offer you the opportunity to engage more in the session. Uh, so, you will have the opportunity uh, by to download the app, going to that app or, or to uh, browse the uh, website which is mentioned now on the screen and to raise the questions you would like to raise to the, to the speakers and you can also vote or like the questions that you will see on, your, uh, on, on the app and the most popular questions will be raised then at the end of the, uh, of the session. Okay, so that's all for the introduction. Now let's move to our first speaker, is Peter Lithians, sorry for the, no, uh, for right. the pronunciation. <laughs> Peter is the deputy mayor of, uh, for traffic and transportation in Amsterdam. His main focus is on the challenge of how to make an old city, Amsterdam, with a complex and dense road network ready for innovation in mobility and uh, logistics. So Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mesgani. You don't have to apologize because you pronounce it uh, uh, correctly. Um, what nobody is seeing is that there's a clock ticking, uh, uh, which uh, adds up to the pressure. But nevertheless, I would like to start with um, uh, thanking the city of Barcelona for hosting this uh, inspiring Smart City Expo. Um, 
I would like to start up with a start up with a with a short movie. Oh, you're already doing it for me. Yeah. You'll be seeing it in a minute. Can we have I the hope. movie, please? Sound? By using our limited space smartly, we have grown big. By building its canals, for example, Amsterdam was able to grow into the largest trading center in the world. But it was never designed for all the traffic that now passes through its streets. That requires new solutions and hard decisions. If we want to grow, we have to deal smartly with the space we have. Now, more than ever, we are able to use data to better manage traffic flows and to better understand them. That will cut out unnecessary traffic in the city. Amsterdam and innovation go hand in hand. Innovation is being encouraged by the city by supporting research into the opportunities and challenges presented by self-driving cars, for example, but also by selecting projects on the basis of innovation like the transport of vulnerable groups. And rather than spending a lot of time deciding on one all-encompassing solution by carrying out experiments straight away, let's see how well cycle highways really work and how we can reorganize urban logistics by using the canals again. Thanks to technology, mobility is becoming more personal and it means that everyone is able to make the fastest and smartest choice that is right for them. This and more is smart mobility, and we are always looking for new ideas and partners. That way, we can keep our city accessible and enjoyable for everyone. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to tell you uh, something about Paul. Paul is 14 years old. Uh, he has multiple disabilities, both physical and mental, and he needs a great deal of care. A great deal of care is therefore unable to live at home. He lives in a residential home, a residential home with other children like him. And in daytime, Paul goes to the day center where he, he receives supervision and care. But that is in a different location to where he lives. It's not that far away. Amsterdam is, Amsterdam is not that big after all. But Paul cannot get there himself. Paul and the other children from the home travel in shuttle buses. They only leave when they are full because otherwise it's not very efficient for the drivers. And the result is that they often have to wait for a long time. That needs to be improved and organized much more smartly. That is why the Amsterdam City Council is working in partnership with the Delft University of Technology and private sector parties to see if Paul and the other children can be taken to the day center in self-driving vehicles. The district where they live is fairly new, so the streets should be suitable. The big challenge, however, is making these vehicles completely safe for the vulnerable group. Short leap in time, forwards. It's 2020. Laura has just moved to Amsterdam, to Sluisburg district. She does not have a car, not that she, well, she cannot have one in any case. Not because she doesn't have a driving license or because she does not want to own one as a matter of principle, but for the simple reason that there's not enough space in her district, in the area where she lives, for everyone to park their cars. And in exchange, her local authority ensures that Laura, with the help of an app on her phone, is able to use all the various transport options that are available. Public transport, self-driving shared cars, shared bicycles, all via the same app. And by bringing together every available option, the local authority is making it easier for the residents of the Slashburg district to choose the transport option that best suits their needs at any particular time. This is how Amsterdam is encouraging mobility as a service. Smart mobility and mobility of the future are for me, not just about how cool and remarkable an innovation is, but more especially how it can be used. How can we use it to improve the lives of the people in Amsterdam, to keep the city accessible, to make it easier for people like Paul, as deputy mayor, I consider what these innovations mean for the decisions that people take as a city and the investments that are made. Self-driving car, it's a good example of this. 
Amsterdam asked the BCG consulting firm to investigate the impact of self-driving transport on the city. And it showed that it could lead to more cars on the streets. That is because self-driving cars would become a type of private taxi, fast transport from door to door. We in Amsterdam, therefore, need to look now at how we can make sure that people share their journeys, especially as the city is going to get busier and busier. More people are moving to the city and the number of tourists increase is increasing every year. And that is why measures are needed. I recently closed one of the most important through roads in, a, in the center of the city. And that was because research showed that a large proportion of the cars that it used had no real need to do so. Doing this means there is now more room for cyclists, pedestrians, and then public transport in the heart of the city of Amsterdam. And what about the cars? Well, it seems that they have found alternative routes using the wider roads that are intended for that purpose. And this decision was entirely based on facts, figures, and a thorough analysis of those facts. It was not based on political dogmas. As a deputy mayor, I have to look to the future. How do we make and keep Amsterdam accessible, even though it's getting busier all the time? Fast-moving technological developments will help us because so much is possible that we could not even dream about at the turn of this century. Smart mobility, using that technology and bringing the parties together who can conceive new things and put them in good use. What I do not want is to build a city that in 20 years time will be perfect for the transport needs of 2016. We have to work hard to make sure that the Amsterdam of 2036 is perfect for transport in 2036. And one very efficient solution to keep the city's traffic moving is so obvious for the Dutch that we oftentimes altogether forget its impact on the city. The bike, it's cheap, it doesn't need a lot of space, and it's good for you and the environment. So it pays off to invest in bike infrastructure. That doesn't only mean bike lanes and bike traffic lights, but also bike parkings. Amsterdam is investing 170 million euros in bike parking solutions near big public transport hubs. Bikes are a brilliant innovation, especially combined with other means of transport, multimodality. Take the train from The Hague to Amsterdam, and for the last mile to your office, you take the public bike. In the inner city, a bike is quite often the fastest way to move around, faster than a car. We are working together with inno innovative companies like TomTom Tom and Google in order to improve traffic flows and to provide people with real-time travel information. The canals are narrow. They were, were originally built in the era of the horse and cart. So a removal lorry can cause considerable holdups. If you can see that on your navigation app, you can immediately decide to take another smarter route. We are creating a network of 4,000 beacons together with Google that travelers can use to better plan their routes or reserve parking spaces. And another area where significant benefits can be had from new technology is that of logistics. Delivery vans swarm around the city, going from door to door, dropping off new shoes, three-piece suits, crates of shopping, and this can all be done much more smartly. Together with a team from the city council, with MIT and other private parties, we are looking to the various possibilities. Self-driving boats on our world-famous canals are one option, for example. The canals were originally built to transport goods, so why should we not use them again for the same purpose? Business in the city, hotels, restaurants, and shops can also contribute to make agreements with the suppliers on smartly combining their deliveries. Algorithms can be used to optimize the routes taken. So there are many opportunities there. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in exciting times. There are so many things that are possible, and I find it tremendously encouraging. I have much hope for the city of the future, smarter, cleaner, more livable, and by taking decisions now, putting the focus on what will be achievable tomorrow, we can actively shape that future today. But perhaps the best thing, I believe, is that all those new developments will help improve the lives of Paul, his parents, and all the people that live in our beautiful cities. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, and thank you for uh uh, emphasizing the need to have a combination of solutions at the end, the combination of options. It's not only by 
promoting or, 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 or developing one mode against the other one is, is the, the, the solution lies in the, uh, in the uh, combination of all options and that uh, transport is a long-term effort. It's starting now to build the city of the future. Thank you. So our next uh, speaker is Alvaro Nicola. He's from the Barcelona City Council. He's the mobility advisor of, at the Barcelona City Council. And uh, amongst other, he was responsible for comparative, uh, developing comparative analysis on urban mobility networks. But uh, today he will uh, speak about the urban mobility plan of uh, Barcelona with a focus on intermodality. Please. Hello. Um, and thank you. For those of you that come from Barcelona, this might not be a, a, new, a new explanation of what is Barcelona doing and what's the challenge that it's, um, that it's having and that it's trying to implement uh, in the next years in the city of Barcelona. Um, first of all, and also main, mainly I, I'm aware that you, you might be aware of, of what are the challenges that the city has with regards to the, the environment, and, and this shows what, uh, what are the, the externalities of, of driving cars in cities, and, and, and also um, the, the, the public health problem that it's causing for everyone that is uh, living now in, in, in Barcelona. Then it's the problem that the, also the traffic it's causing to, um, with, with the noise. I mean, mo most of the daily noise that happens during daytime in Barcelona comes also from traffic. And also we have the issue of, of accidentality. So these three uh, main indicators are the, are, the, are, the, are, are the engine that are, tra are behind uh, all, the, all the challenge of, of, of changing the, the mobility paradigm that Barcelona has. Um, the, um, the objectives are as the main ones um, and the are the same as every, every city as, as every, and every urban mobility plan has in, in, in Europe and, and everywhere in the world. So to create a more um, fair, safe, uh, sustainable, equitable, and efficient, and, uh, and efficient mode of transport in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in not just in the, in the area of Barcelona, but just in the metropolitan one, which is where we are seeing more difficulties to move people in the most um, sustainable modes of transport, like public transportation and, and also bicycles and walking. So this is um, the, the main map that shows what is the, the, the conditions that we are enduring uh, with regards to um, the um, the components, the, the many particles that are affecting our, our life. And uh, this is how it should be in the future after uh, implementing the whole, the whole plant that uh, we have uh, prepared for Barcelona. Of course, in five year times, it's a very short time and, it's, and the change, it's, it's very, very big. So um, it, it needs, in reality, a lot of, um, a lot of work in the middle to, to be able to implement this. Um, this is with regards, if we were seeing before, the impacts that we had uh, with regards to uh, particles contamination, now we are seeing the ones with noise. I mean, this is the current situation and which is the situation we are aiming for in the future after implementing the, the mobility plan. The, this is the, the hierarchy of, of solutions. Now we've seen wh which are the objective, which are the, the, um, the previewed um, outcomes of this policy. And this is um, how we plan we are planning to to achieve this we are going to improve the the way in which uh, um, people walks in barcelona the peop the way in which people use their bicycle public transportation urban distribution of goods and also um, some measures to make uh, the cars um, more efficient in which uh, that means having them um, circulating with less emissions and also having a more efficient use of, of the vehicles so this is the, the actual, the current um, model share that we're having. So um, there's 31% uh, um, of, 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 of trips that are made by my foot. And this is also what would be if we hadn't had uh, our mobility plan. And this is the expected outcome of, of after the implementation of the mobility plan. Um, the main lines of action, I mean, each of, of these policies that we have we have said it has a, um, a, a main policy. So in the, in the pedestrian, to improve the pedestrian accessibility, we have um, the reorganization of all the street network of Barcelona to make it, um, to, to have less cars 
left cars in, in, in the streets. So to have less, uh, less streets used mainly by cars and, and be able to use by other means of transport. And this is what we see, I mean, in this, in this map here. This is the current situation about um, the space that we have available for pedestrians. This is um, what we are thinking that should happen mainly in the, in the central district of Barcelona, that it's the Eixample, which is incomparable to many other um, cities um, um, in, in the world because it's very, very efficient to move, um, to move cars. And so, um, and, and by um, reconverting and restarting the, the network of streets, we can um, make some of these streets not, um, not to have the predominancy of, of, of the use of cars and having these all other, all, uh, these all other uses. By <coughs> and it is important too, and this is a, um, something that we've been working on a lot. Um, I mean, if we have to have, um, if we want to have a, a, a very big impact on the change of, of, the, of the use of public space, we cannot go with the, with the normal um, and with the standard urbanization proposals. We will have to move further and, and faster, and that means that we will need to use um, tactical urbanism and another, an, another strategies like this to, to actually uh, succeed in the, implement, in the fast implementation of, this, of these changes. And this is the, the expected um, city, so we will pass from something like this to something like this with regards to the, um, with the space uh, for that it's um, prioritized for pedestrians and bicycles. Bicycles, we are also working on this. We are com going from 72% uh, um, of people that had covered for the, by the bike networks to 95%. We are working in this. This is one example of, of the bike lanes we are developing. Um, also, as, as commented, uh, as our for Peter, by Peter, I mean the, the um, bike facilities to park cars, uh, to park bicycles. It's also very important, um, and also, uh, and and we are going closer to what is uh, really important for this presentation, and to be, to have a more flexible and multimodal um, mode of tr um, transport system in Barcelona. We have we work a lot in everything that has to do with uh, with intermodality. Intermodality in 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 train stations and in bus in bus stops, and also um, other 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 um, main um, places where um, like equipment um, like um, health centers and and universities and other places where we should provide for this type of, of parking. Um, the the bicing is also a very key element, which is the public bike system that uh, that it will help to extend further than. Um, the, the, um, the, 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 the actual bus or metro stops um, for the users of the public transport to, to do the last mile. And then the main proposals, and I have like um, well, one minute to, to end explaining this. It's the, the all the reorganization of the, of the bus network. Bef this was the bus network before of, of our plans. Um, which is like every bus network with a, a, a huge historical um, uh, background, which means that it, it, came, it comes from the previous um, tramway networks of Barcelona, and it has developed historically into, the, into this network, which is at this moment very difficult to understand to everyone that it's not using um, the bus network in Barcelona. And this is what we, we aim to have in, in, the, in the near future. It's not that we are converting every line. It's what, what, uh, what the work that we are doing is just selecting those ones that are more able to, to, um, to become, uh, to have a more clear um, um, route, just to convert it into, into this specific um, network that, would, that will help people from just by one interchange between two um, bus, bus lines to, to access every, everywhere in the city. So by creating that, um, that network that it's uh, orthogonal or rectangular, we will be able to go just one by one interchange to, from every, everywhere in the city to everywhere. Um, that helps us to uh, be more specific in the areas in which we provide this, this, um, this service and then to increase the, the frequency. This is a very important part for this. And then to work a lot in these interchange points and also work with not just with the, with the central um, with the main network serving Barcelona, but, but with all the other networks that are serving um, Barcelona, which means um, the, all, the, all the buses accessing Barcelona. 
And we are working in other uh, big projects of, of public transport, as, as I showed in the previous um, sections, but I'm, I'm running out of time. So tramway, it's another important uh, project in which we are working, and we are also finishing um, the, 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 the line number nine, which will be a, a very long line that gets from the, from the north to south of Barcelona, also connecting the airport. So, and, uh, to, and, and to finish, I mean, to round up, this um, this intermodal, intermodal system, we have um, the um, the um, the H O the H O V um, lanes in the in the highways that will help um, buses accessing Barcelona and also a project of having um, the park and ride um, the metropolitan park and ride areas to help people not living in, in in dense areas to actually use their cars to access the public transport infrastructure to access Barcelona studying also what are the main corridors for accessing Barcelona and working too on the accessibility for every, every, um, every person and um, also the uh, reconversion of our ticketing, um, our, our ticketing um, um, service in to access, which will, I mean, be, it's something that it's going to be more extended by, by our colleague here from MasterCard but it's um, also a, a, a big project that will help making public transport uh, more flexible and, and more multimodal. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, each time it's uh, impressive to listen to the presentation and to see the presentation about Barcelona like with, the, with this uh, Barcelona model, I would say, with a structured and very hierarchized uh, approach for, uh, for mobility. Thank you very much. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Jesus Padilla. He is the president of the uh, Mexican Association of uh, Transport and uh, Mobility and the public transport entrepreneur, actually. And he has been promoting uh, transport modernization in Mexico City. And uh, so he will share with us the, his uh, approach for uh, public transport in, uh, in uh, Mexico. And his speech will be in uh, Spanish. Please, the floor is yours. Muchísimas gracias. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Gracias por la oportunidad de estar aquí con ponentes tan destacados en una ciudad tan hermosa y en un continente tan lejano para nosotros. Eh, después de escuchar a mis compañeros, me parece que el tema de la intermodalidad radica en la realidad de cada uno de nuestros países, de nuestras ciudades. Yo solo quisiera comentarles que en la zona metropolitana del Valle de México, con un poquito más de 22 millones de habitantes, nos deben de estar sobrando aproximadamente unas 30 mil unidades de transporte. Para que tomen una dimensión, nos sobran 30 mil unidades de transporte. Gestionar estos temas se vuelve un asunto bastante complicado porque en tema de intermodalidad tenemos todo tipo de vehículos prestando servicio de la manera más ineficiente posible y por lo tanto cuando uno estructura, cuando uno disciplina los servicios de transporte, evidentemente se asegura uno que el servicio tenga una frecuencia, que pase con regularidad. Nosotros lo hacemos muy bien porque somos tantos que pasamos todo el tiempo, siempre hay servicio, pero nos hemos vuelto muy ineficientes en esa parte. El reparto modal en la zona metropolitana tenemos aproximadamente casi 22 millones de habitantes, 33 millones de tramos de viaje, 23.2 millones son de transporte público, la otra parte es de transporte privado, hacemos aproximadamente 8.7 millones de viajes por día en auto privado y en taxi. El problema de la motorización y saturación en el Valle de México y en la capital nos ha llevado a una crisis ambiental muy severa, eh, con problemas donde se están descansando en algunas ocasiones hasta 2 millones de automotores al día. Y aquí tenemos un conjunto de imágenes de la tipología de vehículos que tenemos, inclusive hay vehículos más pequeños, más viejos, el último que se encuentra hasta abajo ya tiene prácticamente 30 años de vida útil, casi donde chocan se desarman, y el resultado de una inadecuada política tarifaria, que es diferente en cada uno de los estados de la República Mexicana y donde se resuelve, se resuelve con criterios más políticos que técnicos. Aquí tenemos la evolución de la longitud de modos de transporte de mediana y alta capacidad. 
evidentemente el comportamiento del metro, los buenos momentos donde tuvimos recursos en la capital del país para poder hacer metro. Ahora cada vez es más complicado utilizar recursos para el transporte masivo, pero entre más masivo, mejor. Y en esta proporción de servicios <risa> hemos ido alcanzando eh, la, alguna proporción que permite mejorar las, los niveles de seguridad y de traslado de las personas. Para el 2018 estaremos estimando 500 kilómetros de servicios de líneas de mediana y alta capacidad, de los cuales cerca del 40% serán sistemas de carriles confinados, con flexibilidad, accesibilidad, serán menos invasivos, tendrán un menor costo y serán mucho más simples en su implantación. En la flexibilidad del sistema Metrobús para la capital implica inversión pública más inversión privada, a diferencia de muchos países del mundo, en nuestro país, en México, el transporte está concesionado a personas individuales, les denominamos hombre camión, la mayoría son dueños de su vehículo y por ello hay una anarquía impresionante en la prestación del servicio, donde no somos competitivos, pero sí competimos entre todos, eh, echándonos los vehículos, correteándonos, peleándonos el pasaje, lo que llamamos guerra del centavo y prestando un servicio de muy, muy mala calidad. En ese sentido, los esfuerzos que se vienen haciendo en diferentes ciudades de la, del país radican en es, eh, transporte masivo con carriles exclusivos, vehículos en algunos casos de plataforma alta, otros vehículos con características muy comunes para ustedes, pero muy novedosos para nuestro país, como son los articulados, biarticulados, híbridos, piso bajo, aire acondicionado. Y futuro en el 2017, hacia finales, estaremos implantando en la principal vialidad de la capital, en la Avenida Reforma, vehículos de dos pisos iguales a los que se encuentran en Londres. Se ha hecho un gran esfuerzo por el impulso al sistema de bicicleta como un transporte alternativo. Cada vez se generan más bicistacionamientos, hay toda una campaña de uso de este tipo de transporte alternativo en todo el país y evidentemente como es un esfuerzo inducido, entre más bicistacionamientos se colocan, más se utiliza este tipo de transporte. La distribución de la población en la zona metropolitana del país por tamaño del 90 al 2030 nos indica aquí eh, aproximadamente el comportamiento <coughs> que estamos teniendo y el número de habitantes con el que deberíamos estar nosotros más o menos quedando en 29 ciudades, que de entre 0.5 y 5 millones de habitantes, con densidades a uh, 100, 100 habitantes por hectárea. La presentación eh, es cortita porque más o menos trae muy controlados, pero… Quisiera compartirles que el reto que tenemos las ciudades nos diferencia unas de otras. Decía el compañero de Amsterdam, Peter, la realidad que tiene una ciudad pequeña donde restringir el uso del automotor ha sido relativamente sencillo y tiene una, to, toda una tradición el uso de la bicicleta. En México le llamamos pueblos bicicleteros, aquellos que estaban atrasados, aquellos que no se desarrollaban, aquellos que eh, ocupaban la bicicleta porque no tenían una alternativa mejor, pero ahora todos estamos regresando al uso de la bicicleta, entonces lo de pueblo bicicletero se está perdiendo. Ciertamente tenemos un reto extraordinario, eh, no tenemos subsidio para el transporte público de pasajeros, no tenemos todavía una política clara de cómo integrar los diferentes modos de transporte, eh, no hemos definido una estrategia nacional con una ley nacional que pueda hacer homogéneo los esfuerzos desde las características y configuración de la flota, así como la definición de los diferentes métodos para cálculo de las tarifas. Y estamos en un proceso intensivo, pero todavía muy lejos de las necesidades de planeación adecuada para la implantación de nuevos modelos de transporte que aseguren la calidad en su prestación de servicio. Seguramente estos retos que estamos viviendo en México los estaremos eh, eh, prácticamente superando en los futuros años. Hoy tenemos no solamente retos de orden tecnológico, parece que la tecnología resuelve todo, pero la tecnología cuesta y un teléfono de, de 100 euros puede hacer lo mismo que un teléfono de 1000 euros. Eh, nos, está, nos estamos dando cuenta que es complicado acceder a tecnología que donde no existe la política del subsidio y la tarifa no es competitiva, pues no tenemos condiciones para acceder a ella. Y para que se den una idea, la tarifa promedio en nuestro país debe estar en el rango de los 25 centavos de dólar, 20, 25 centavos de dólar. Por lo tanto, en ese sentido podemos tener eh, tecnología eh, vieja 
eh, estamos apostándole más al tema de emisiones contaminantes que de accesibilidad y en ese sentido creo que los retos que tiene el país todavía son muy grandes. Eh, también el tema de la flexibilidad y la multimodalidad está en cómo se conceptualizan las cosas. Me parece que cada traje a la medida, cada quien tiene que tropicalizar su realidad de acuerdo a sus condiciones y características de desarrollo que ha tenido, no solamente por el tema de la tecnología en material rodante, sino por las condiciones de los pavimentos, el diseño y propia planeación de las ciudades. Y en esa medida creo que los retos que tenemos en el país todavía son muy grandes. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for showing this uh, growth of public transport supply in Mexico City, the impressive growth of, of supply, and uh, and the need to rationalize actually the different modes uh, and and, and, and to, uh, by adopting large uh, capacity buses. And also, I I take note of your last uh, remark that technology in, is not an end in itself, and maybe we we can come back on on that aspect during the, the discussion. Thank you very much. So our uh, fourth uh, speaker is uh, Ian Slater. He's from uh, MasterCard and the senior financial service professional in the uh, partnership, uh, enterprise partnership team of MasterCards uh, with a specific responsibility for driving sales uh, uh, and uh, leadership in the urban transit uh, segment. And he will be uh, uh, speaking on uh, smart ticketing with focus on mobile ticketing. Yes, please. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. I think some of you may be wondering why a credit card company is up here standing talking to you about multimodal um, transportation systems. And it's a good question. I, mean, I got a text from my wife this morning asking me exactly the same question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, I can address some of, the, some of those questions during the course of the presentation, and, and I'll take the presentation home afterwards and show it to my wife. I think the important thing to grasp is that we talk about cities and you come to an event like this and there's lots of people showing different things of a wide variety of, of different goods and services from companies like a MasterCard, a Microsoft, there's guys out there talking about smart bins. There, there, there are a lot of bits and pieces um, available for you to think about. And the reason for this is that we are now living in the age of the city, much more so than at any time in uh, in mankind or, or, or in history. You know, if we think about the development of people as people moved into cities during the industrialization age of the past 200 years, that is really peaking now. We are at a situation where half of the world's population now lives within cities, and by 2050, that will be at 70%. And this brings with it vast, vast challenges, both for those who live within the cities, but also those of us who come and visit, be it for something like this or for pure touristic reasons. We see that 6% of uh, growth in tourism year on year is taking place, which outstrips most other forms of commerce. And people come to cities, and they want their cities to be as livable in as um, the people who live there. But this brings with it significant challenges. So traditionally, people are basing transit on cash. But cash is slow, it's dirty, it's prone to fraud. You see the, the middle, uh, no, the first, uh, the first of the round circles there where it says congestion. That's a picture from Bogota, which shows people getting on buses to go to work. Cash in that type of environment is hugely inefficient. If every one of those people has to stand up and hand over their cash to get on the bus, that line is only going to get longer and longer and longer. Take people like, longer to get to work and increase the number of social ills within society as people struggle to, to get to work on time and earn the money that they need to feed their families. So you have congestion, you have cash, you have significant overcrowding on transit systems. So one of the things that most transit operating providers and most cities want to know about is how can I move people around that city in an efficient way? How do I get them from point A to point B without them necessarily all congregating on point C at exactly the same point? How do I communicate effectively to my citizens and convince them of the, the way that um, is most efficient for them to move around my city. And then finally, we've, we've heard about this a lot with the, the talk of kind of uh, public transport and bicycles and, and low emission vehicles. Pollution is a significant issue, both in the Western developed markets, but also significantly, as we heard about from Mexico, in, in some of the more developing markets as well. You know, pollution becomes a real way that holds people back in their daily lives. 
And as more cars get on the roads, <coughs> more people move around, then pollution only increases. So we as MasterCard, we look at some of these things and we can help with some of these issues. We can't help with all of them, but we can help with some of them. And in many cases, working with partners, we can bring solu solutions to cities that start to directly address them. And that is, that is why I'm here today, to talk about some of those things that, that, that we can help with. I want to highlight in particular the middle, the middle bucket there, or the middle button, where you have 300 local smart card systems around the world. Pretty much every city in the world is very proud of its uh, local smart card system. Um, they each have set it up, they've invested a huge amount of money, they've named it after um, some form of, of marine animal, be it oyster, opal, orca, octopus, something of this nature. But each of these are generic to that particular city. They don't interoperate with anything else. And one of the rites of passage for anybody to feel that they belong in a city is their ability to navigate the local purse scheme, their ability to load and maintain that particular um, scheme and make it work for them. If you're a tourist, that is a huge turnoff for you arriving in a city. So if you only have to go to any major city in the world, and the first thing that you see as you come out of the airport and access the public, um, public transport system is lines of confused tourists who may not necessarily speak the language of that city particularly well, trying to work out how they buy a ticket to take them into the town that they've just come to visit. And that's a very negative experience for a lot of people. And a lot of it is born out of like, the fact that each city has implemented its own local purse scheme. People are terrified that they're going to get arrested on their ride into town. In their first day in a the city, they're going to get arrested for not buying the right, the right ticket on the way in. And everything that a city can do to improve that process not only makes their city more livable for their citizens, but it makes it significantly more attractive for people coming to visit it as well. So what does all that mean? Well, I think it means that um, we talked about multimodality, which is, which is a horrible phrase. But I think one of the things that we mean by that is that we are at a point of convergence. We're seeing that a number of things are all coming together at the same point in time to create um, a unique moment where ticketing, the use of mobile phones and payments all come together. And that is why MasterCard feels it has a role to play in this. Because if you look at payment and you look at the interface with payment on mobile and then the delivery of a ticket through that type of infrastructure, MasterCard has a very relevant role to play for that side of things. So we have been working with cities around the world. Um, we've implemented open loop contactless ticketing in, in London being the best example, but not just in London, in Chicago. Singapore has announced that it will go open loop um, early in the new year. Sydney will go open loop next year. And we see a raft of uh, cities moving to this ticketing type, away from the old purse based system. And for good reason, it's significantly more efficient. Uh, we see closed loop mobile ticketing based systems coming into play, again, backed by traditional payment cards. So you can see this in, in Athens and, and also most recently in New York, but in other cities as well, in Boston, in uh, San Diego, in a wide variety of, of different cities, implementing very quick QR code based ticketing systems. It's quick, it's cheap, it's efficient, it doesn't require anybody to swap out any gate lines, it doesn't require huge infrastructure implementing. And so particularly in um, cities that want to move very quickly to a, um, a mobile-based ticketing system, as well as more developing nations, that type of option is very important. And then finally, we still see closed loop kind of hybrid type products where you have a transit purse and um, a kind of non-transit payment purse on the same card. Mumbai and Bogota being the best examples of those types of things. All of these things go a long way to transforming the travel experience within a city. So if you look at London, this slide specifically refers to London. We've got 200 million tourists coming into London every year. All of those can now just tap and go when they arrive at Heathrow or any of the other. Don't have to load an Oyster card, don't have to buy a ticket. As long as they've got a contactless card, they tap in, they tap out, the system correct, calculates the correct fare, they need to do nothing else. Same is true for people moving around the city as uh, those of us who live there. Same deal. Tap in, tap out. No buying tickets makes it a much more simple and efficient thing and leverages technology that people already have in their pockets. <clears throat> and for the city itself, it has a significant benefit. So we have seen in London a 30% reduction in, um, uh, sorry, we've seen a significant, yeah, between 5% yeah, reduction 
in the cost of the amount of, of a, a transit system, ticketing system to the city. So each ticket used to cost the City of London 14% of the fare that they collected. With the implementation of Open Loop, it now it costs them 9%. We've got 7.7 .7 million journeys a week and growing week on week. It's been a very big success and a key kind of um, use case for the rest of the world. But we're not just talking about contactless in terms of card, but also increasingly leveraging of the mobile. And the best way to do this is ticketing on, on the phone. So here we have an example of um, Athens, where they implemented ticketing on the, the phone about a year ago, and also in Boston. So in both cases, the individual lodges a card on file, they can buy a ticket, they get a QR code, they scan the QR code, or the QR code is inspected by um, a, a, a ticket inspector, and that's all they need to do. Very quick, very efficient. Took about three to four months to set up in each of these cases. And this has recently gone live in New York. So if you ride the rail into New York from any of the main kind of commuter lines, you can now use the, the QR code space app to do that. There's about 174 million rides a year coming into New York. There's now no need to queue up to buy a ticket. For those of you who've done it before, it's, it's not a great experience. And takes out a huge cost of fare co uh, collection. We're seeing about 200,000 unique uh, new rides on the system month on month. It's been live since about September with a significantly improved user experience. It's been a big kind of, um, a big benefit for, for people who, who ride the, the rails and for those of us who work for MasterCard because the MasterCard headquarters is just outside New York. So we have to use this system. But what does this mean? All of this brings back to the point that there are a number of different options that a sissy can use. And they start from ticketing, but we shouldn't necessarily think that they end there. Because the key thing about all of this is that it generates data. And cities want data. So they can improve the way that people move around by paying for their tickets, buying different things. They can leverage different, the same ticket type across different types of transportation. But out of this, they generate data. And from that, generate that data, they can learn who's in their city, where do they go, what type of people are they, what do they like, what don't they like. And then they can communicate effectively to those people. And the leveraging of a mobile-based platform only helps that piece. Then you can know, you know who lives in a particular part of the city, what type of services do you need to deliver them, what type of individuals are there, do they need old people's homes, do they need creches, what type of shops should you encourage into them, all of those types of things. And you can communicate to them about what's going on on the transit network at that particular time. You can tell people when there's a problem with the bus. You can reroute them. You can put them onto a different thing. But all of this comes from the fact that, A, you have an open infrastructure in terms of ticketing, and then the ability to leverage the data behind it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, at the end, you presented the business case of mobile yeah. ticketing. That's and uh, if you are not uh, still convinced, we can elaborate further. And uh, yeah, business case, because it's make, uh, it makes public transport easier to use at the end for the, uh, for the, uh, and, and more attractive for the customers, more efficient uh, from the operator's side uh, with the shorter transaction times, so better, better uh, efficiency in operation, and more cost, cost effective because we have lower investment compared to traditional uh, smart ticketing system. Okay, so we listened to our uh, four speakers. I think you were so many, so, so, so concentrated and focused on the presentation that you didn't raise a lot of questions on, on the app. So I have only two questions. But if you have uh, more questions, uh, if you want to, to, to raise your questions, we can, we can take more from the, from the floor. So the first one, uh, could you please explain how or, or, and, and who are the main stakeholders and how they collaborate inside the field of urban mobility. So who would like to, well, to jump in? Yeah, it's a general question. So for those who are involved in managing stakeholders, maybe yeah, you, well, we Peter? <laughs> yeah. This works, yeah. Well, one of the major concerns is how to manage stakeholders in policy, but um, well, when it comes to stakeholders in, 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 in Smart mobile? Yeah, it's okay. Uh, yes. People living in a city are the, the the main stakeholders. People living in the city, people visiting the city. And I think that's one of the things we could learn in Amsterdam from a city as Barcelona. 
um, uh, how to involve people living in your city, uh, uh, considering them as experts. They're experts in their own city. And I know that Barcelona has a, well, a tradition in the last few years of um, uh, using all that information of their citizens. Um, so the main stakeholders are the people living in your city. Uh, but al obviously also a tr a transport uh, uh, companies, public transport companies, uh, uh, one m major stakeholder. Uh, I posed a question to you uh, uh, earlier before we started this session. Why are you here? Not, not, not. <laughs> sounds a bit, bit, bit rough. But w why, why is is uh, Eurocard, Mastercard involved in in in, in smart mobility, in public transport um, uh, developments, and well, to be honest, uh, after your presentation, it's quite clear to me, and I think you can explain it to your wife when you get back. Uh, won't be uh, <laughs> a, a lot of problems to to, to explain it. But um, one of the main, well, basically, um, the main stakeholder is the person living in your city, using um, uh, uh, his bike or public transport or his car, uh, uh, being unable to park, uh, 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 stuck in a traffic jam. Those are the real experts you uh, shouldn't ignore. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Can I just add something? I think one of the important things is that there are many stakeholders, and we have to recognize there are many stakeholders, both in terms of the agencies of the city and the suppliers that they contract with to, to deliver a service. And the key learning that we've found is that for these projects to be successful, those agencies and actors need to learn to collaborate together on a common platform. And they don't traditionally do that very well in a lot of cities. Whereby, and therefore, one of the things that holds this stuff back, and I think everybody agrees with the general vision that's been articulated, particularly by the cities here, but the cities themselves can play a role as acting as kind of honest broker to bring these, e these different and disparate parties together and make sure they collaborate towards uh, a common goal on, a same, on the same kind of platform level. And we as, as suppliers, as, as third parties, we need that in order to be successful. Okay. Thank you. Yes, um, Alvaro. Just to elaborate on what Peter was saying, it is indeed, I mean, every inch of our city, it's, it's currently being used by, by some people or, or, or another by, in one way. I mean, either they walk, they use a bicycle, they, they use public transport, and changing that um, equilibrium, it takes, I mean, a lot of effort, um, in, 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 in a lot of technical effort to have a new proposal, but it takes even a, 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 more, <laughs> a more challenging effort to, to convince people that they have um, to change the way in which uh, um, they move and, and also to, to um, engage them in the in the project that you are trying to to put to put forward so yeah I, I do agree that um, maybe the, the, the main challenge is and the main stakeholders it's it's citizens in the city yo creo que es muy importante que los actores de la movilidad logren un concierto de voluntades deben ser autoridades debe ser academia, debe ser consultores, proveedores, los operadores y desde luego todo esto tiene que estar en concierto a favor del usuario. Me parece que en la medida que ellos se logran poner de acuerdo empezamos a darle sentido no solamente a la tecnología inteligente sino al uso inteligente de la tecnología. Ok. Thank you. Maybe one word about the stakeholders, because what we are noticing now that we have a, a, a bigger variety of stakeholders. I mean, we used to have the mobility in the mobility sector or in the public transport sector. I mean, the authority, the operator, the industry supplier, the citizens, of course, the customers. But now we have new actors, new players coming from we see the, 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 the banking or, or the, the, they say the financial uh, sector coming from the IT and, 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 uh, and media uh, sectors. So we have uh, this new app, uh, app developers and app, uh, I mean, um, Uber and, 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 uh, and Karim in the Middle East and Bridge and, and Lyft and others. And the challenge is really to, to, to organize uh, mobility with the involvement of all these stakeholders. Uh, and, and we still need to find the right way to, to, uh, to organize the mobility sector with the involvement of each stakeholder because uh, it's not, uh, it's the, 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 the aim is not to exclude stakeholders, but 
to organize the, the, the role of each. Okay, is there any other question from the, from the audience? I have one on my tablet, if you don't have. Yes, Robert, please. Uh, a mic, please. Microphone. Two questions to Mexico. I heard that uh, the share of ladies using the bicycles increased tremendously in Mexico City. The second question is, uh, what is your experience with the hybrid passes and are they uh, plug-in hybrid passes or just uh, mild hybrid passes? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Bueno, respecto a la primera parte del uso de las damas, las mujeres en, el, en el, las bicicletas, nosotros tenemos ya el 52% de las mujeres ocupando el transporte público de manera general. Ese es un dato muy importante porque se han eh, integrado a la vida productiva del país. Y eh, tenemos también la evidencia que en este transporte alternativo, ¿sí? cada vez es mayor el número de mujeres que lo están ocupando, además con toda la seguridad. Ni siquiera tenemos eh, un dato significativo de robo de, de, de bicicletas o de accidentes con ellas. Sobre el transporte, eh, tenemos muy pocos vehículos híbridos, tenemos unos que están corriendo prácticamente de la zona centro al aeropuerto y con esos vehículos, bueno, lo único que hemos encontrado es un poquito la experiencia sobre su desempeño, el uso de las baterías. Eh, nos parecía que hace seis años que los tomamos, eran los primeros que estábamos recibiendo nosotros en la capital del país y la tecnología de, de sueños para acá pues, ha revolucionado de manera muy, muy importante. Eh, está apostándole el país y en particular la Ciudad de México a autobuses Euro 6, eh, ya sea gas natural o con un diésel específico y evidentemente también ya están planeándose algunos eh, corredores de transporte con vehículos eléctricos. Cuando nos vemos en la UITP nos decían que eso pasaría por el 2030, la tecnología ha avanzado demasiado rápido y seguramente estaremos integrando una flotilla mucho más amplia de híbridos y de autobuses eléctricos para la capital del país. Ok, thank you. Uh, one question, one last question, or maybe before the last, uh, on the tablet is what are the, the challenges of uh, developing and implementing flexible transport systems? So, would any one of you? Flexible transport systems, so in demand, uh, on demand transport, uh, shared transport, autonomous vehicles. So again, as a, as, a, as a vendor, I'd say they're twofold. Firstly, um, to my previous point, getting the various actors within a city to work together. And, and as you're quite right, we have many more actors than were ever the case, as is evidenced by my presence. Um, I think the second thing is the ability to make sure that cities grasp the opportunity to operate on common standards. So we have the opportunity now for people to have a similar transit experience in one city around the world from anyone else, um, leveraging mobile or contactless technology. But as cities think about implementing these, if they do so on a, a unitary sense, i.e. specific to that city, then actually they undermine um, the cross-fertilization approach that they can get from them, and they actually undermine some of the value. And therefore, a city needs to think about where does it want to be unique and specific, and where does it want to leverage kind of industry standards and norms for, for greater utilization between cities? And those are, those are questions that cities can only answer themselves, but they're important that they think about um, how they best address them. Um, maybe, well, if I was talking about, and before um, citizens now, maybe to, to, to implement that, um, the other thing that it's very well um, um, already organized and developed, and, and, and it's, it's the, in the way in which uh, we provide those services. Um, so uh, with um, the competition of each administration um, that it's interacting in the same space, that's, um, it always have a, a history and it takes, and, and all the contracts between 
and well, the, the public and the private providing uh, and all the, the stakeholders, the different stakeholders. It's, uh, it, it takes uh, a, a, a much more longer time to change that uh, with regards and, and, and in comparison with the technical work that it's probably necessary to imagine um, different landscapes and different um, in, in, well, and different multimodels and, and more flexible systems. So, if in one hand we have the difficulty to explaining all the improvements that, they that they, we would like to, to implement and, and engage the citizens, the other one then in which we have a lot of work to do is to actually recognize, I mean, all the administrations interacting and, and knowing um, uh, their competences and, and their, their time frames that they need to change things actually uh, acting uh, upon, upon that, it's, it's very, very um, complicated too. Yes, well, when it, when it comes to, to flexibility, um, I, I think we have to recognize that, that people have a very individual uh, mobility need. Um, uh, uh, in, in highly densely populated areas, it, it's, it's not that difficult to operate uh, uh, heavy bus lines, um, uh, uh, subways, etc. The problem is when you come in, in, in lower dense areas, rural areas, uh, it's, 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 quite, it's, it's simply not affordable to, to operate heavy bus lines because it, there are hardly, well, there are not enough uh, people traveling. So you, you have to um, uh, um, uh, facilitate them with mobility as a service. Um, and also the, the heavy bus lines in a city, in a densely populated area, um, the problem with public transport is that the the bus stop is not well, often not the place where you live, and the bus stop where you where you end up your journey is mostly not the uh, the place where your office is or your house is. So it comes to the last and the first mile, um, which take quite a lot of time when you regard to the uh, the total journey, and that's one of the one of the main challenges for us to to make those th that 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 first and last mile to make it faster, to make it easier, and to lure people into the uh, public transport. Thank you. Would you like to add? So, nos, pare nos parece que entre menos planeación tiene una ciudad, más complejidad tiene su servicio de transporte. Sí, creo que la primera flexibilidad que debemos de tener cuando planteamos estos temas es la, la flexibilidad conceptual. Es como nos estamos imaginando el servicio. A mí me cuesta mucho trabajo ver en Europa buses a ciertas horas vacíos, donde traen tres, cuatro pasajeros en todos lados. Nos cuesta mucho trabajo porque en Ciudad de México tratamos de que tengan un nivel de ocupación permanente. Cuesta mucho trabajo porque las ciudades son modelos preestablecidos hace muchos años, de 100, 200 años. Y no es como un modelo de corbata, como un modelo de saco, como un modelo de teléfono que se puede cambiar. Cambiar una ciudad cuesta mucho dinero y cuesta mucho tiempo. Por lo tanto, tenemos que repensar cómo van a ser las ciudades del futuro en función de cómo nos vamos a mover. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the, the speakers for your presentations and for your input in the discussion and for you for your attention. So as you can, you have noticed, I mean, the session highlighted different aspects of uh, multimodality and the necessity to offer uh, uh, multiple mobility solutions which complement each other. It was mentioned in, in the last uh, st statement, and, uh, and especially complementarity between conventional transport system and shared or, or, or uh, um, flexible transport systems. So, and to this end, all stakeholders should be involved and could have a contribution to make mobility easier and more efficient. Of course, the Congress is about smart cities, but smart shouldn't be limited to the technology side. It's not just about innovative technologies, information system, or digitalization. A smart technology must be deployed in a smart governance system, otherwise it will be worthless and we lose its benefits, and it was mentioned by the gentleman from uh, uh, Mexico City that the, it's not only about technologies, it's also about affordability of, of, of the users to have access to this technology and to have access to, to public transport. And if we focus on mobility, smart mobility is not only about new, flexible, and on-demand transport or autonomous cars. It's important that these systems are shared and integrated with the conventional public transport system and with mass transit. And mass transit, to my opinion, will remain the backbone of the transport system, but it needs to be complemented by uh, shared and, and the flexible transport solutions to offer the door-to-door -door 
uh, mobility for the citizens. Thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you a, a nice conference and a rich conference. Thank you.